Yeah, we're in chapter 7, verse 25. That's where we are. Unmarried and widowed, okay. back to Bible study. It's been a long time since we've had Bible study. A lot of stuff going on. We had confirmation class, we had the voters meeting, and the third thing. Uh, I don't remember. There was a third thing. There was, on the 18th. We have last week. Last week was confirmation. Well, that was voters before that, it was MEA weekend. Cool. So now we're here. Picking up where we left off. Yeah, maybe one day we'll finish first Corinthians. Take us last time in Revelation. It's true. <laughs> yeah, um, I could go to Facebook and see if people are online. Uh, so far, none. When you said that we were going to be talking about the end of the world today, it, I, I, I almost burst out laughing to see how many people were going to be thrown into a panic. As we know. Okay. Yeah. It's every, every year at the church here, um, we're getting towards the end of it now, because um, the church here starts in December with Advent. Um, and leading up to it, we have the end of the world. And so this week's text is end of the world, and next week's text will be the same kind of thing, focusing on the end of the world. And so these three texts today, um, I thought the one from Amos was most interesting, uh, because it's like, don't be excited about the end of the world. I am excited about the end of the I world. I am too. Uh, but he's talking about something else uh, in, his, in his passage. Uh, when he writes it. Uh, there's this, there was, for Amos, there was a problem with um, outward worship, where people were just kind of going through the motions and expecting to be saved. Jesus encounters this with the Pharisees and Sadducees in the New Testament. He calls them uh, whitewashed tombs, uh, which is kind of a gross image. It's really, really bad breath. Uh, out of your mouth comes death. That it's not that you're not saved by going to church, you're not saved by just kind of going through the motions, that's not what saves you. And so in the text, he's like, I'm tired of your songs, I'm tired of your feasts, I'm tired of your festivals, I'm tired of your worship, because you're just, just going through the motions. This isn't, this sort isn't of like the people that just show up on Easter and Christmas? Well, I don't know. This is more of a, we think we're saved because we're following the rules, kind of thing. That if I come here and I the right sheep and do these things. And I just follow the rules that are laid out. That's what brings in salvation. But well, that's not how you're saved. You're saved by having faith, trusting in God's promises. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, any <clears throat> any act that we would do uh, wouldn't be a any act that we would do is meaningless without faith. Okay. Um, and so that's what he's getting at there. It talks about the, the events like it says, let justice flow down pour out like some kind of water or something like that. Um, God is very concerned about justice. Um, and this is a, uh, a sense of, you know, here's what's right and here's what's wrong, and actual, and actual true justice, because God is a perfectly just judge. And so people are not following the commandments, they take advantage of one another, um, specifically in, in, those, in the Old Testament context, there's three things. It's taking care of the poor, taking care of the widow, and taking care of the orphan. And those, and if you take advantage of the poor, take advantage of the, the widow, take advantage of the orphan, God does not look kindly upon that. And that would be an injustice, and God wants there to be justice um, coming out. Yeah. 
And so he's like, don't bring, don't ask for the end of the world because it's not going to go well for you. Is what Amos is getting at. You're, you're not right. You're, you're worshiping like your worship is empty. It's meaningless. You're not, you're not saved. And so don't bring it. Don't ask God for the end of the world because it's not going to go well in your favor. And you don't want that to happen. Well, that's not true for everyone, though. No, that's what Amos was talking about in this passage. Because those who are being saved, it's a super exciting day. Those who are not saved. Not so much. Not so much. No. Same thing with the parable, the, third, the parable from Matthew today, with the, uh, the, the maidens and the, the lambs. Um, in the parable, everybody falls asleep, right? So the prepared man they fall asleep. Uh, the issue is how much time you have to prepare. Or are you not prepared before you fall asleep? Okay. You don't have time to get ready when you fall asleep. You're already asleep. You're already ready yeah. or not. Which is what, same kind of thing. When the end comes, the end comes. And you either are ready or you're not ready. You don't have a chance to, there's no right at that point. Um, all text about this little thing. Yeah, so that's good. There's just so much good stuff in the Bible. We could talk about it forever. Probably will. Great. All right, so we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, we're going to be in verse 25. We're going to get go through this a little bit at a time here. I think we'll just finish chapter 7 today. I'm not quite sure if I want to take on chapter 8 yet. Let's see if we can get to chapter 7. Oh, yeah. Do you want to read? All right, I'll read it. So, now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment. The Lord's mercy is. I think that in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? If you a wife, don't seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if the betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown short, very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who as though they have no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For this present form of this world is passing away. Okay, that, that has me thoroughly confused. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Which part of it has you thoroughly confused? Uh, verse 25 right. and all the way through 31. Yeah, so. Um, not, okay, so if you're bound to a wife, don't seek to be free. Yep. I, yeah, so one of the things that's, that's, that's going on in First Corinthians, again, Context of the letter. We talked about the city of Corinth a whole bunch, and we'll keep talking about it because it's super important. Paul's writing to a new church, and new churches uh, are filled of new converts to Christianity. And so there's people coming in from again all of the religions of Corinth. We're talking, you know, Greek gods, Roman gods, Egyptian gods, Canaanite gods, just everybody there. Um, and so they're they're leaving these false religions because they hear the gospel and they come to faith in Christ. What not everybody in the household does. Excuse me. Um, so it's a very real situation where the husband might have faith and the wife not have faith, or the wife have faith and the husband not have faith. Um, we saw this in chapter 7. We talked about this um, earlier in the chapter, I mean, the last time we met, that um, uh, this this principles of, of divorce that if if you want to get divorced if, if the unbelieving spouse wants to get divorced let them walk away okay um, but you as the believing spouse don't seek divorce got it okay um, this, this is what he's getting at here this is a uh, yeah we, we talk we talk that talk that so here in verse verse 27 are you married well don't seek to be free don't try to that go makes sense. and, and, and uh, yeah, but are you, don't seek to be married. Um, as he's saying here, don't try to marry somebody who's not a Christian. Uh, 
Uh, we don't want to. It's, it's better to be single than to be married to someone who doesn't have who doesn't have faith. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. But if you do marry, it's fine. It's not simple to get married. You know, it's it's better to to, to, have, to not do this. But if you do, it's not wrong to marry. Um, but if you do get married, you're going to have problems. Every marriage has problems, uh, and that's that's just the reality of, of marriages. Um, of just of sin in the world. Every marriage is Paul himself never married, and so he's he thought that it was a superior way to go um, because he was more able to focus on his work, on, on being an apostle and spreading the gospel. Um, and he didn't have marital problems because he was like, I would spare you the marital problems. I don't have marital problems, I'm not married. I think this question that <clears throat> quite came up before um, the, yeah. the fact that Paul didn't marry. Um, is, is basically that what the Catholic priests were looking at, being that they, they're able to focus? No, oh, I've asked this question before, but I have had like a sieve. Yeah, that's right. Um, that they're able to focus on the Word of God and proclaiming it and not having to worry about wife or family. Yeah. That's word. It also comes from St. Jerome. Uh, St. Jerome translated the, the Bible into Latin. For the Vulgate, the most influential, at least I use it in the Catholic Church. Uh, this is their their translation. Um, but he wasn't married. And so because of St. Jerome and because of Paul, uh, there's a tradition of, well, as a priest, then you're married to the church. And so you spend all of your time focused on the church. Um, yeah, that's, that's where that comes from. I mean, I get that, and that's a spiritual marriage, but you can also have an earthly marriage. Yeah, so one of our problems. Or am I, with, off, uh, am I off the mark there? No, one of our problems with it. So let's go to First Timothy chapter three on page twelve sixty three. So chapter three, and so it says qualifications for overseers. Mm -hmm. The word overseer is episcopos. Um, this is qualifications for pastors. And so there's a few places in the Bible that really lays out the kind of person a pastor needs to be in order to be qualified for a pastor. And so this is a uh, first chapter, again, 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. This is a, anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Uh, therefore, an overseer, a pastor, bishop, whatever you want to say, um, Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that look says it all. Um, I think I just, no, it says live, but it's asking me to finish. The camera flashed like it was going off, but it still says that it's live. Okay, whatever. We'll keep talking. Yep, so husband of one wife. And so, yes, pastors can be married. Not um, continuing on, sober minded. Self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not drunk, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, doesn't love money. Uh, verse 4, he must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if one does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Um, and so it would seem that Paul, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy this letter, encouraging him how to be a good pastor. Um, so 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy... And Titus are called the pastoral letters. They're written to, to pastors. And so it seems like Paul is encouraging pastors to be married um, as, we, as we read through this. Okay. Especially verse 4 and 5. How do you do church if you can't manage your own? Um, yeah. I'm going to go on to Timothy. Titus. <clears throat> so Titus chapter 1, we're going to be on page 1271. So again, we're having this, this category of, of elder, pastor, um, that kind of thing. Um, verse, verse 6 here. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers, of ordination, 
For an overseer is God's story must be above reproach. So again, here we have of being a pastor, his husband of one wife. Um, and so that God is very much in favor of pastors being married. Although it's not required, it's also not forbidden. Okay. Um, and so uh, we in the Lutheran Church and many other denominations don't have a man-made celibacy. Um, yeah. Great question. Are we still live? Um, yep, so we're not in um, verse 29. This is what I mean. For the appointed time has grown very short from now on. For those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they're not mourning, those who rejoice as though they're not rejoicing, those who buy goods as though they don't have any goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For this present form of this world is. Uh, so, Paul here, he says, even if you're married, um, you're to primarily be on Christ. And um, what he's doing, because this world is, is passing away. And so all the things that we're experiencing now aren't going to last forever. Whether it's your, your marriage, whether it's the joy you're experiencing or the sadness you're experiencing, whether it's the stuff that you have or the stuff that you don't have, it's all passing away. Um, there's something greater in store. Um, this present form of this world is passing away. There's going to be new creation. And so he's inviting us to look at the world through God's eyes, through eternal eyes, through the eyes of salvation. Um, you know, the 70, 80, 90, 100 years we have on earth is but a blip. Then blip <laughs> uh, compared to eternity. And so the focus is on the things above, on, on what's yet to come. And that's what he's, he's getting at here in this first paragraph. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Sheila. Sue says you're here, so I assume you are there. Now all of the internet knows. <laughs> cool, makes sense? Mm -hmm. It does now. I put into that perspective, um, I kind of <clears throat> keep forgetting um, the context in which Paul is writing yeah. with being in Corinth and the sinfulness of the city. Yeah, yeah. And it, it really helps um, having, having this context of what's going on. Because this, this section here, again, the second half of First Corinthians is all, it's like a fact list, FAQs, frequently asked questions. And it's just kind of going through rapid fire. Here's the answers. Okay, let's go on then. Verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and is anxious The unmarried is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefits, not to lay a restraint upon you, but to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. And so again, he's talking about what the focus needs to be. He says it's easier to focus on God if you're not married. Okay. It's true, because if you're married, you're not just focused on God, but you're fulfilling your vocation as spouse, and you're focused on your spouse, which is how it's supposed to be. Um, a husband is supposed to be anxious or concerned about, his, about the Lord and about his wife. A wife is to be concerned about the Lord and about her husband. Um, and he's saying this, he's like, this isn't, I'm not trying to restrain you. I'm not saying don't get married, but um, I want to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion. If you are married, be aware of the extra burden, the extra work it takes to be focused on God. But if you, um, if the husband and the wife are both faithful to God, then they're sharing that burden, aren't they? Yep. They both have to be faithful to God. Absolutely. Um, but it's, there's, even if you're you know, married to a believing spouse, you still have divided attention because you still are focusing on your spouse too. Um, there are earthly concerns of caring for a marriage. You, know, you have to spend time on that. Right. But I'm thinking it's easier. Um, parties in the marriage are faithful. Yes. To divide the attention rather than one 
not being faithful. You're absolutely right. Um, it's super important that you and your spouse share the same faith. It just makes life so much smoother. <laughs> If anyone thinks, um, we'll continue on to the next section, this was a little bit easier. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry, it's no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no, necessar under no necessity, if one has determined in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed as well, and he who refrains from marriage does even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whoever she wishes, only the Lord. Yet it is my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, so Paul is, he's, he's going through stuff again here before I talk to him. Anything stand out to you? Yes. I think I'm looking at it at a more on a more personal level than what Paul is intending. Um, I'm just reading that um, in my judgment, if she is happy, um, she is happier if she remains as she is. You know, if if her spouse dies, in my case, mm -hmm. we're, we're divorced, and I'm thinking rather than. Look elsewhere to be happy as I am. Yeah. So. That's good. That's, that's healthy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he's, again, he's talking here about this, this distinction um, being married. He's not saying don't get married. He's like, you do well to get married. Um, and it's, it's desirable to be married. Um, and then here in verse 37, being under no necessity but having his desire under control. So he's like, if you're able to, to keep the, the sinful desires of the flesh under control, um, and you can do well with it, that's, that's a wonderful thing. But it's not for everyone. There is no necessity here. Okay. Um, if you're going to get married, it's great to get married. Uh, God's design for humanity is, is to be married. That's how God created us back in the Garden of Eden. Um, but being able to instead focus solely on God, as the apostle is, is also really good. Uh, it's a win-win situation. Um, you know, uh, as you see here in verse 40, I think that I also have the Spirit of God. He's like, I'm not married. That doesn't make me less Christian. <laughs> this is the Apostle Paul who's talking. Uh, <laughs> that um, he, he is very glad that he gets to devote his time um, to God solely, and he wants, every, he wants others to have that same opportunity. Okay. Um, widowed or widower, um, whoever it is, um, or you said you're betrothed, if you're not married yet, or if you're engaged to be married, um, spend that time, again, focused on God. Great. Any questions? Can I go off on a tangent? Uh, tangents are fantastic. Where did the idea come from? That is a fantastic tangent. We'll take up most of our time, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> No, and it's just, it's not really that long of a discussion. There, there, it comes from a, a misunderstanding of how God works. And the, the word that we will use in the Lutheran church is vocation. Vocation is just another way of saying calling. Uh, if, we, if we go back to the, the false understanding of salvation, that salvation comes by works, that by, by doing good things, you, you are saved. Um, if, that's, if that's true, then there is nothing nobler than spending your whole time doing good things. And then one of the best things that you can do, uh, as Paul is talking about here, is dedicating your time solely to God. Okay. And that's the best thing that you can do. And so from this understanding then that if, okay, if I'm going to be saved by, by what I do, and I'm going to be serious about it, I'm going to spend all of my time doing the most important things. Um, which led to what's called the monastic movement, becoming a monk or a nun, uh, to just girl monks. Um, 
where it comes from, um, where they forsake all of the things the world has to offer. That's why they have those strange clothes. Mm -hmm. When they go, they lock themselves in places, you know, monasteries and, and convents and things. Um, so they don't have any worldly, anything of the world. They're just solely dedicated on serving God. Um, and they take vows of celibacy and on and on and on. on. But this is just what they're going to do. Martin Luther himself was a monk. Um, he was an Augustinian monk. Uh, which just means that he followed in the footsteps of Augustine in his teaching. Augustine was a church father. The other famous monks are Dominican monks, which follow St. Dominic. Same thing with nuns. There's all different varieties of, of nuns and what schools they come from. Luther, after working very hard as a monk, is very most dedicated of monks. Spending hours a day in confession and working very hard to write his acts of penance. It's like, this is, this is pointless. This isn't what God wants us to do. God has not called us to seclude ourselves from the rest of the world and focus only on ourselves. He's called us to live apart from the rest of the world in that the way that we do things is different, but we still do things. We still engage the world. When the Apostle Paul, um, which is, he would be the example, right? This, this you know, celibate his whole life, single his whole life, um, proclaiming the gospel, focused solely on God. What did he do? Well, when he moved to a town, he set up shop as a, as a tent maker. So he would, he made tents. That was his, or, or, that was his booths. That was his full-time job, and then he was an apostle as well. And that's what God's called us to do, is that we engage the world through our work. Um, there is a saying that may or may not be true, um, that, that Luther, uh, that the, uh, the Christian shoemaker does service to God, not by placing crosses on his shoes, but by making the best shoe that he can. Yeah. Um, and so our callings, God has called the world to do things. Um, we're in the world, but not of the world. It's the language of the serve God by serving our neighbor. Um, and uh, in God, uh, because when they're focused on their personal piety, it's taking them away from the responsibility that God has to, to love your neighbor. An example of this in Scripture would be the Good Samaritan story. Where there's the priest and the Levite who who come walking by, and they just see the man suffering and dying, and they leave him there to go and do the highest things, um, because they have to go and serve in the temple. And so, um, we see that God wants us to serve our neighbor and not just focus on our pious things. Right. Pious things are not wrong, but if they take us away from serving our neighbor, they start to become problems. Makes sense. Cool. Who actually started the first convents and monasteries? I couldn't tell you. Probably, well, probably St. Jerome, if I had to guess. Yes. Because he was against marriage, or not against marriage, but yeah. more for dedicating his life just to God. Yep, 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 yep. Cool. Any other questions? Mm. We lost somebody. Okay. Well, we don't have time to get to chapter eight today. Okay. So we'll probably stop here a few minutes early and surprise all the high school kids by being done before them <laughs> <laughs> for the first time ever. Did you want this um, also? Oh. Great. Any last questions for the day then? Okay. Short and sweet. Yeah, so we're going to have Bible study done next week. Continue chapter 8, which I love. Talking about food being sacrificed to idols. It's a fantastic passage in Scripture. And that'll be the 22nd. I'm going on vacation. I won't be here, um, obviously. I'm going to go and see my mom. But the pastor who is going to be here will do the Bible study. And so we'll have Bible study with him. Oh, awesome. Whatever he wants to talk about. It should be fun. So, let's close with the word. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day and for this nice weather that we've been having this, this past week. Lord, I ask that you would bless us to, to be a light in this world. Lord, help us to see our position in life, that we would find wherever we would be, that we would give you glory and, and focus on you and the things above, rather than the things of this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.